Hello, hello everyone and welcome to Med Hedelsner Podcast Season 4, Episode 8. We are back. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to everyone yes. in Armenian. Shnoravor <laughs> Nortari. Well, no. Shnoravor Amanor Yev Surp Tanund. Okay. Thank you for joining us live on YouTube, Facebook and X. And uh, to all of you who are listening to us or will be listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, we appreciate you tuning in. It's Thursday, January 11th, 2024. One, still one, not, one, yeah, one. Still not used to the 2024. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm your host, Vika Slanyan. And as always, I'm joined by my brother here, Mr. Mike Balian, where we discuss our great army in history, covering different eras, topics, and people. Please hit that like button. Make sure you are subscribed and share with your friends and family. If you like what we are doing here at the Medosnet Podcast, please consider supporting the show by going to patreon.com slash medhedosnet and uh, supporting the show by becoming a Patreon. Today's episode is titled Assassin's Saint, the story of Solomon Telerian. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the show, you will understand why. We're excited to introduce Mr. Michael Lee Gavlek, who is a Hollywood producer. Hello, hello. Um, our paths crossed with Michael through a shared connection. And uh, he's here to share a story that um, caught our attention. Um, most of us in the Armenian community are familiar with Project Nemesis mm -hmm. and the story of Solomon Telerian, a uh, figure of immense national pride. But it's rare to, and quite frankly remarkable, to encounter someone outside the Armenian community who genuinely is interested in exploring and sharing the true story of Solomon's life. Um, Michael, uh, with no direct ties to our heritage, uh, stands out as the rare individual. Today, uh, he's going to join us, basically, um, and tell us a very important chapter in our history, bringing a unique and respectful perspective to the story that is close to all of our, yes. all of our hearts as Armenian. Michael, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you, Vic and Mike. It is an honor to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation. Um, like I said, uh, we met you through a mutual friend, and uh, I didn't know what to expect. You know, when someone tells you there's this guy, you know, he's doing this and that, and you're just like, okay. Um, but, I mean, the minute you start telling your story, I was like, we need to have you on the show. And... People need to hear about this. Um, so again, uh, we appreciate you being here. Yeah. But uh, before we get into the main conversation about uh, Solomon's life and how you came to learn about it, can you tell the audience a bit about who Michael is, where you grew up, uh, maybe a bit about your family, uh, what you do for work, so our audience knows who you are? Well, that's a whole nother two hour podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to do it in five minutes if we okay. could. Had plenty of practice boiling this down. Okay. Uh, just begging to differ with you in one respect, having no direct connection. I'm a Christian. Yes. Well, so. thank you. Yes. That, I apologize. That is a direct connection. <laughs> what I meant by, I know, you know, I know, I know. of uh, Armenian uh, ancestry, yeah. you know, you're not Armenian. What is your background? Uh, Gavlak is Slavic. Okay. Um, and I learned this recently that the uh, the Slavs have, have the distinction of being the first non-Nazi group to start helping Hitler. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because of proximity, Probably, they have yeah, no the choice. It's yeah, like, yeah. Who, who's the power here? Yeah. Who are we going to yep. ally with? It could with? be Sweden. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Switzerland. Switzerland, too. too. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. All right. So. Uh, All right. So more about yourself. All right. Um, hmm. I saw Star Wars when I was seven years old, <laughs> like everyone else. <laughs> right? uh, I, my life changed. I walked into this dark theater having no idea what to expect. And I, when I came out, I was a new man. Uh, but honestly, it was that moment uh, that, and I could literally, I could describe for you the, the narrative of Star Wars, that first film, A New Hope, 
and the narrative is Solgon Tellurian, and it, it could be parallel, right? A young kid is away from home at work when his family is massacred by an evil empire, yeah. and he connects with a uh, an underground rebellion, Operation Nemesis, yeah. know, and it gets put in position to fire a single bullet to destroy the death machine, Yep. right? So I saw Star Wars at the age of seven, and I believe... It was God preparing me for to, for me to see the Sogum and Tullerian yeah. story yeah. properly. It's a story of justice, yeah, right? Yeah. A story of justice, and one man brought justice. So that's that's we'll get to well, that. Yeah, right? we'll get yeah. to that. Where, where, where'd you grow up? Where, 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 everybody still talking about me. Okay. Where are you? <laughs> where are you from? Where'd you grow up? Uh, okay, I grew up in the United States of America. <laughs> And that's not a joke. Let me boil it down. I'm gonna, I'll tell a couple, couple quick anecdotes that will give you the, the idea. I moved more than 25 times in the first 20 years of my life. Oof. I went to six different schools for high school in three different states and still graduated in four years. My brother met my sister at my wedding and said, she's hot. And I said, she's too old for you. <laughs> <laughs> just to just a few anecdotes to emphasize the dysfunction and uh, abnormal upbringing that I had. So I was born in Phoenix, Arizona. To uh, my parents split when I was about two years old. My mom married another guy, and we you know, it was just yeah. uh, you know, moving from state to find the grass is greener over here, yeah. find a job, find moving with family. So I bounced between my mom and my stepdad and my dad uh, for all those years, and then at the age of eighteen. I had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ. I mean, my, my life, I was a drug addict. I was a diagnosed alcoholic when I was 14. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but since I saw Star Wars when I was seven, anytime anyone would, would ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was, I'm going to be a filmmaker. I'm going to be a film, not I want to be, or I think it was just something I, you I, knew, you knew that. Yeah. It was, yeah. I, I had a vision. I had, a vision of of bringing justice, yeah. or a story of justice. Yeah. So I ended up in the mission field in Mexico for a while. Uh, I was a uh, associate youth pastor for a couple of large churches, and then decided when I was 24 years old, I should probably get a college degree yeah. if I'm going to be taken seriously in in the world. I I had academic interests, uh, and so I got a, my degree from Vanguard University in public address. Vanguard down in Costa Mesa, mm -hmm. California. And my degree was in public address or a communications emphasis in public address, but we shared, uh, we shared classes with the film, TV and radio majors. So the film, TV and radio majors, one of, the, one of my friends said, Hey, I have to do my senior project. I have to do a short film. I can do the tech side, but I don't have a story. Do you want to see if we can do our senior project together? Uh -huh. I'm like, I got a story. And we went to our deans. They said yes. And so I was location scouting, acting, and, you know, I was doing all of that other stuff, writing the story. And it was like, uh, just was coming natural. Almost a one man production. Yeah. yeah. And, and it was like, and I was 27 at the time, right? Talking about late bloomer. So I was yeah. 27 years old and I'm like, oh, I think this is what um, I, I thought that was what I was supposed to do. And now I have the opportunity to do it and it feels natural. I, didn't go into the entertainment industry right away, uh, but I did meet the girl of my dreams. God brought the, the amazing, perfect woman into yeah. my life. And then about three years into that, I got laid off from my career in heavy roadway construction. And it was now or never. Uh, I was 33 yeah. at that time. It was now or never. I'm going to pursue somehow to get my foot yeah. in the door. Long story short, somebody saw something I edited. They hired me on Super Nanny. The reality, oh, really? Wow. Reality TV. That nice. was my first job in Hollywood was worse than a PA, worse than a production assistant. I was a casting uh, associate where I had to go out and find, I had to go to parks and malls yeah, and, and, scout. and look at children's behavior. I had to be the creeper kind of sitting back and watching Wild. children. And then I had to go up to their, their parents and say, Hey, um, we want to put your poor parenting skills on TV for everyone to see. <laughs> That's not the pitch. Obviously it was, we have this, this great nanny from England who really, you know, can help you. Do you want to be on TV on this show called super nanny? 
And the show took off. And so I was the first casting. I was a casting associate. Then I became casting editor. Then I worked up to assistant editor on Super Nanny. Then as Hollywood, that was my foot in the door at the yeah. age of 35. Yeah. So I was 35 when I got my first job in Hollywood. Yeah. And in a short 15 years, I, I'm a union editor. And then I won an Emmy as a producer. And nice. The show I work on doesn't have producers. So the editors get produced. And, and yeah. if you know anything about Hollywood, editors are producers. We're, yeah. we're the final, yep. you know, we're the, we yeah. do the final cut, the final mm -hmm. writing, the final edit. So I am a producer, but technically my day job is as an editor in Hollywood. Hey, that's what I do every podcast. <laughs> I produce. Hey, you never know. It, it, it might be a career in You never it. know. You never know. Man. It's all right. I'll stay with Hollywood. Quit this. I have to take over. It's okay. Okay, I'm good with this. All right. So with that said, I've been dying to ask you, and I know I asked you off camera, okay, um, but you only gave me that much. So what ha what were the sequence of events that got you to pay attention to this story or maybe find out about this story with Solomon Teledian? And then I'll have likely follow-up questions to this. Like, I'm dying to hear the rest of this just keep me on track because oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> vic knows already i sat yeah, with for yeah. about an hour and a half he's yeah. like when you come on we need a list of questions just to keep we, you on track yeah we didn't have enough time before yeah. before we went live so okay so the job actually that i have now i was at this job about six or seven, uh, 2017 okay uh 2017 i was working at the current job that i i'm back at now but they were downsizing at the time and I was low man, low man on the totem pole. And so I saw, they gave me about a four month window that, yeah. you know, you're going to need to, the way Hollywood is, you know, you go from show to show, your gig yeah. is up, go find another gig. So I asked myself that question. I'm like, okay, God brought me to Hollywood for a reason. I think, is it to work for somebody else or is it to tell an important story? Yeah. Right. And that was sincerely my my mentality. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, it's again, another now or never kind of moment. I have this opportunity. It's like, I'm, I have three children to support, but I have this opportunity to go in a different direction. And I had mentors around me, people that I, you know, uh, um, one of the, the creator of home improvement. Yeah. Right? Like somehow I became friends with him, became a mentor to me, one of the creators. And, and I went to him and I said, I gave him a script. I'm like, do you think, you know, I should stick to editing or is writing and all of this, do, you know, do I have a future? And he was yeah. like, you, you have what it takes. And he's not just going to say that. Right. And so that was like the wind beneath my wings sure. to, to step out. And uh, I, I literally did a three day fast. I'm like, God, I'm, I don't know what is going on. I just need, I just know I need your guidance. It's about a month. This is a August of 2017 is when, or September of 2017 is when I did the fast mm -hmm. a month later the end of September, early October, I'm sitting in a pitch meeting with some, I got connected to this guy who was a potential investor and pitching ideas to him. And he didn't bite on any of my ideas. And it was a two hour meeting. Yeah. Normally those are 45 minute meetings. So yeah. it was, you know, a good yeah. conversation. And he said, and this was like the sixth floor of a 12 story building on the corner of Lexington and uh, uh, brand in Glendale. Okay. Right. So yeah, Armenia yeah, central, yeah, yeah. this guy's not an Armenian by the way, but he was a Christian and he goes, I don't know if this is true, but my friends told me that Armenia was the first Christian nation. And this is 2017, two years after 2015, the centennial and my gym was in Glendale. And so I saw the flags on the cars in 2015 yeah, yeah. And, and I had friends, basketball player guys that were Armenians. I'm like, what's the deal with this here? I was in my, at the time, 40s. I'm like, I didn't know anything about it. I had heard of the Armenian genocide. I couldn't tell you anything. I couldn't yeah. tell you when it was, where it was, why it was, any of it. So this guy's telling me, I think there's a story here. Armenia is the first Christian nation. I think there must be a Geronimo type hero wow. from the Armenian genocide. This is this is what the guy says to me in the middle of this two hour he meeting. He straight planted the seed. Exactly. Yeah. He said two phrases that came out of his mouth in the middle of two hours of dialogue, two phrases he said that stuck with me. First Christian nation. As a Christian, I, the concept had never even entered yeah, my mind. Yeah, I drew you to it. It's like, yeah. first Christian nation? What does that even mean? Yeah. Right. And then he said, Armenian genocide movie. I'm like, Armenian genocide movie? So I leave that meeting and I'm, I'm divided. 
he didn't buy any of my ideas. I was pitching my ideas. To <laughs> That's this a guy, good point. Yeah. Right. I'm like, yeah. tomorrow is my last day of work. You got and, some homework to do. Right. Yeah. I, I came into that meeting thinking, yeah, this is it. That's like, I'm going to be, he's going to buy one of my ideas. We're going to move into production and blah, blah, blah. And he didn't. So that's one side of my brain. The other side is, wait, he pitched an idea to me. If I look into this idea, maybe, maybe he'll be on board, et cetera. Yeah. So this is late September, 2017, Armenian genocide movie are three words I had never heard before. So they're kind of sticking in my brain. I get to my car downstairs on Lexington and brand I open up my phone before I go to my next destination, just checking headlines and emails. The very first three words my eyes come upon at the top of my newsfeed, Armenian genocide movie, right? So it goes from my ears to my wow. eyes. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's I, like- I believe you. It's like, this was like, okay, uh, I'm, I'm being communicated to, I better pay attention. And it was about like Dean Cain and Montel- Williams had a documentary called yeah. Architects yeah. of Denial. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and the news it was on article, PBS. Right. The news article was about Glendale, the mall wasn't going to advertise for it because it's political. I'm like, in Glendale, you're not going to advertise for Armenian genocide. So yeah. that's basically what the article was talking about. So I'm like, okay. I immediately reached out to one of my coworkers because um, the next day was going to be my last day. And it's the only Armenian I knew. And she and I are great friends, one of my favorite coworkers. And I said, hey, you're Armenian, right? Tell me. Just tell me. I need somebody to tell me. So I get to work the next day. She takes me to Wikipedia. And she pulls up, like, Wikipedia is like a fire hose. Yeah. yeah. For somebody who <laughs> uninitiated, <laughs> uninitiated <laughs> Armenian genocide. And she pulls it up. And she pulls up. She's, she's ARF. So she pulls up a picture of 30 guys with bandolero bullet belts and rifles. Yeah. She goes, these are my people. And I'm looking at 30 Armenian Geronimos. Right. I'm like, there's a story here. There's a hero here. There's gotta be something. So I just start researching the history and I'm looking for a storyline because in Hollywood, you have to have a happy ending. Yeah. Right. To, for a movie to be successful, there mm -hmm. has to be a, a positive resolution, some kind of justice. Yeah. And this is a genocide of an entire culture. How do you find a happy ending? I was like, Komitas, oh, he went crazy and committed suicide. Mm, he'd be a good hero, but you'd have to change things. Maybe you do an amalgam of different characters. Like all of those thoughts yeah. are going through my head. And then I come across a little, it was just one little entry on Wikipedia. Talat Pasha assassinated by Sogomon Talirian. I'm like, what? <laughs> Two emotions filled me in that instant. A righteous indignation, uh -huh. not just at the actions of what happened, the perpetrator, but that I didn't know it already. The righteous indignation was genocide is not just massacring a people. It's eliminating them from history so that nobody ever even knew they ever existed. And so I was experiencing that, wait, the genocide is continuing. I didn't know this. Yeah. Most people in the English-speaking world don't know this. That is the effect of genocide. Yeah. So it's righteous indignation. The second thought that crossed my mind was, where's his family? He lived to tell his story. Where's his family? Yeah. This is a buried treasure. So that's... You know, that's how you came that's across That's how I it. came across yeah. this old Montalarian story wow. in October of 2017. Wow. That's amazing. Wow. I want to thank everybody who's joining us live on YouTube, Facebook, and X. Uh, I think you can actually make comments on X now before you couldn't. But um, if you guys have any questions for Michael as we are having this conversation, yeah, feel free feel to free. ask in the chat and we will pass the message on to Michael. And uh, But uh, the the next question, so, so you, you obviously, you know, come across this, this, this character that is now, you know, you're like, oh my God, I got to find out more about him. Tell us the story of what happened after that and at what point or what exactly made you go, this story has to come to the screen and it has like to be the, told the like right the way. The aha moment. Yeah. Like the this is it moment. It was the moment I discovered that the moment I discovered that Sogomon Talirian wrote his own account. That, Which a lot of people don't know about. Right? Yeah. Like he lived to tell about it, right? We, he was acquitted. Yeah. Right? And yeah. What was it? Like a two or three day trial? It was a two day right? trial. Yeah. yeah. 
And so <laughs> normally somebody that assassinates a world leader disappears, right? <laughs> they get disappeared. He was acquitted in a very public setting. And so he- And it was, it, if memory serves me right, wasn't it a German court? Was it a yep, German yep. court? Yeah, it's a German court. Yeah. Everything was German. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It happened in because, Berlin. Because Talat, because the Ottomans, Germany was an ally yes. of the Ottomans yeah. and, and Germany was actually kind of overseeing, overseeing the genocide. Yeah. Like yeah. They had, and so they harbored him and they, he was, he was with, with an ally. Talat had an alias and he was, he was negotiating to return to power. Like he was having meetings with diplomats, yeah. world leaders to return to power and finish the job. Like that's this story. Crazy. Right. Yeah. So when I found out that Sokman Talirian wrote his own memoir, I'm like, that's the hero's story. Like yeah. his personal point of view. Yeah. Uh, but all I had access to was the the court transcript. So I found an Armenian bookstore uh, in Glendale, yeah. Abriel, Arno, yeah. Arno. Yeah. If you know Arno. Uh, Abriel Books uh, in Glendale, if if you're interested in. Yeah. Or April. We got to plug them. Or, or April. Uh, yeah. 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 They have amazing than. books in English and in Armenian. Uh, you can find a lot of books. So. Well, let me just say some miracles have transpo- transpired in Abriel. They, they used to be on Broadway and then mm-hmm. the pandemic, they had to downsize and move. But it's still, to me, it's holy ground. And yeah. this, here's the story. Um, I can tell probably the first, there's a series of miracles and I use that language. Some people think you, I throw it around uh, too much, but if you're in my shoes, if you're in my shoes, there's no other explanation. So here I am an Odar, right? A, an outsider. Yeah. Right? I don't know any of this stuff. And I find, I'm like, where should I go? Ah, Armenian bookstore. And I find the best Ar- Armenian bookstore. Yeah. And, and I live like, you know, 15 minutes from it. I'm like, okay. So I go in, uh, I find out Arme- uh, so much clear and wrote his own memoir. I go to Arno. This is probably my second time there. I'm like, do you have a copy? Do you have a copy? Can I get a copy? And he's like, I don't have a copy, but it wouldn't do you any good. It wouldn't do you any good if I did, because it's never been translated into English. But that couldn't have disappointed you. I mean, well... Again, I'm of two, again, I'm of two minds. Okay. All right. Number one, dang, I can't read the hero's point of view right now. I'm yeah. like, this guy wrote his own story. That's what I need to hear. I need to hear his point of view. And the other, the other side is, oh, if it's never been told in English, it's never been told. It's a buried treasure, Bingo. quite yeah. literally a buried treasure yeah. right under the surface of history with the Ottoman Empire, the Turkey and Germany and the United States all suppressing all stories of our, of the genocide. This, this incredible story is just right there under this, under the surface. Yeah. So I was invigorated and frustrated, <laughs> right? I don't know anything. I'm not a historian. I'm a Hollywood guy looking for a story, a, a journalist, if you will. Yeah. Like I'm yeah. actually a journalist. Like I work for in the news. Well, side I mean, you're doing your investigation. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm investigating. Yeah. I'm an investigative Absolutely. journalist. This is, this is what's going on. Technically. Yeah, well, I mean, everything you're telling us is basically investigative journalism. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm doing the footwork. Yeah. So I, <laughs> Arno can tell you, I don't know if Arno remembers this day. I'm sure he does. I pull out a stool in the middle of the aisle at a real bookstore and I'm pulling books off the shelf, just like trying to find something to glom onto. And <laughs> the, 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 bell rings on the door, right? Some, some guy walks in, you know, and I'm not paying attention. He yeah. walks into the back and go to find, goes to find Arno. I'm not kidding. Arno comes out with this guy and he says, it's such a coincidence that you're here. <laughs> I, I, those are I, verbatim. It's such a coincidence that you're here. This guy never comes in here. Whenever he orders books, he does it online. So this young guy comes, you know, he introduces me to him. Turns out he's a historian. Mm-hmm. He's got his master's degree in Ottoman history, World War I in sp- specifically. And he worked in the law offices of the guy who translated the court transcript, right? The guy named uh, Vartkes Yegiayan. You're kidding. Translated the court, the German court transcript. It was in German. Yeah. It was translated to Armenian and he translated from Armenian to English. And that's all I was, 
I had access to. So I had already read this. This kid worked in that office for seven years as the staff historian, and he had just lost his job because Vargas had just passed away about a month earlier or about two months earlier. Like he had just passed away. So this kid lost his job right in this transition period. And he walks in the bookstore when I'm looking for information. So he, I, I'm introduced to him. His name is Armin Manuk Khaloyan. He's currently at Georgetown and possibly watching this. If he's not watching it live, he'll be watching it. So Armin walks in and I'm like, I think I'm supposed to tell the Sobelman Tolerian story. Yeah. I, I think I'm supposed to tell that story. And I'm like, will you help me? You want to help me with this? He goes, sure. Just like that. I, I, that's how he talks. Sure. Turns out he was like, Vartkus had been tapped for the promise, like had advised on the promise, but they didn't get credited. They didn't, you know. Yeah. And, and so Armin joined up and became my little brother for the next six years. And, he's, and now he's at Georgetown. He's about to teach. I got to put this plug in here. Yeah, go ahead. Literally this semester, as of this week, Armin is four years into his PhD or yeah. three and a half years into his PhD program. He is now a professor at Georgetown teaching the Sogamon Tolerian story this semester for the first time ever. Get his info. We need to talk to him. Oh, it's in the works already. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. We have been connected. Okay, good. He good. told me you guys yeah, talked good. yesterday. Yeah. yeah. So this kid, the way I would describe him is he materialized out of heaven right in front of me before I knew I needed him, right? Before I knew what I needed, the, a, a human that knows the history. So not only did he start handing me books, uh, stuff to read. He translated, did an on-the-fly translation, thing. a 10-hour audio over about three months. He would translate a chapter, and there's this huge cliffhanger at the end of the chapter. And he's like, <laughs> that's all for now. I'm like, dude, I can't wait 10 days for your next day. <laughs> so you were, you were like hooked at the same time. It's like, okay, it's work. But well, here's the thing. When I'm what listening, happens next? When yeah. I'm listening to him translate what Sogomon Tolerian wrote in his own words, it is visual. It is cinematic. Of course. Can't believe it. And well, it, I mean, here, one thing about translation from Armenian to English, you have to, you, uh, you know, the, the words are, the words are, yeah. And so yeah, you have yeah. to, in order to feel what he felt uh, or, or describing the scene, whatever it is, you have to translate it properly because if one word is off, that scene can be completely, uh, you know, oh, read the wrong way. Absolutely. So that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. And I, this has all been obviously an education for me. And we could go on a, a major tangent about the Armenian language and how rich and deep it is. I'm like, it's deeper than the English language. Oh, the English of course it is. Armenian has been around for what, four or 5,000 years, yeah. right? And it's like when you have a language that old that's unaltered, like yeah. Hebrew, for example, is an old language, but they had about almost 2,000 years where it wasn't spoken. Yes. So if you don't use a language, it doesn't develop, it doesn't yeah. deepen. Yeah, it doesn't Armenia evolve. is like this incredibly rich language. Well, not just that. Armenia also has over 250 dialects. Yeah. So sometimes you could be in from one region to another, you could be speaking Armenian to one another and not understand a word. So I just met a guy uh, who's teaching... And he explained it to me. This was just yesterday or the day before. He's teaching Armenian. I'm like, are you teaching Western Armenian or Eastern Armenian? He's like, I'm actually teaching Latin Armenian. It's like the good good up, good up, yeah, good up, right? It's yeah. like there's this ancient, deep, rich version that, again, that's a tangent. <laughs> it's okay. But, but another thing here about Armin, the guy, the kid who materialized right out of heaven yeah. in front of me, not only did you do the translation for me, because he worked with Vartkus, Vartkus had taken him along the, for the ride to meet Sogomon's son. Sogomon Tellurian, who lived to tell the story, lived happily ever after. He married the girl of his dreams. Yeah. He had two sons, and one of them is still alive. 20, yeah. 2017. So within two months of learning all of this, yeah. I'm introduced to the family. So like I said, men mentioned before, I, had, I was of two minds. I was yep. righteous indignation and where's the family because authenticity is important. Of course. This story is going to be attacked, right? The story's it's oh, the absolutely. government of Turkey, right? I'm, I'm painting a target on my face. You need to be authentic. You need to you need to get the facts straight and you need it to come from the source, the Tellurian estate. Absolutely. Right?
So, so, uh, so Armin Manukhloyan currently teaching at Georgetown, and I'm going to be a guest on April 29th in his class as the Tellurian expert, right? Uh, that kid, he, he know he knows how important he is. He, <laughs> he does. He's, he's, he's on his way up. He, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with in academia for sure. Okay. And so I'm assuming this led to other things like, for instance, um, we talked about off camera, you acquiring the rights to telling the story of Solomon Tellerian. Um, I'm sure this was some sort of complex process. I, 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 it had to have been because it's, it's not like, oh, here, sign here. It can't be. No, no way. So how did you manage this? Um, In detail. <laughs> well, well, I mean, like how, there is an NDA. There's certainly no. I, I'm sure there is. I'm sure then you don't have to, you don't have to break any of that. And I, I, I know NDAs. I'm under like 40 of them, but um, how did this all transpire? Uh, for those of for the uninformed, NDA stands for non disclosure non agreement. It's a legally binding agreement. Honestly, because I fast forward, spoiler alert, I own the rights, right? Yeah. Uh, it's me and my partner, right? So I have okay. an Armenian business partner. Yeah. And so Project Justice LLC is the IP co that owns the life story rights of Solomon Talir. Okay. How did we arrive at that? Um, the only things I can't say are. Uh, Zavin's actual name, right? Okay. Like his name is Zavin, first name. But Solomon Tellurian, to hide from the Turks, right? He's sure. the, he, if he's the hero of Armenia, he's the enemy of Turkey. Oh, absolutely. Right? So, so, yeah. And I can't tell where he is, but I can tell you oh, just no, about everything you else, don't, right? Yeah. Yeah. Since I am the owner of the IP, the NDA is pretty much up to me. All right, so how did we get the rights? <laughs> Look at his face, I love it. December... Of 2017, okay. again, two months after I first heard the name Sogomon Tellurian, I find out where the son is. Armin uh, sends an email to him and says, hey, there's this Hollywood guy that's interested in talking to you about your father's story. Um, oh. You know, would you be interested in, you know, hearing him out? And he responded to Armin. Armin forwarded me the email and the email said this. He's like, oh, because this is 2017, two years after 2015. And 2015 is the centennial where everybody comes out of the woodworks looking for hero stories of Armenian, right? Yeah. So he had been subjected to that. You know, he's Armenian. He married a non-Armenian. He's lived a successful, flourishing life outside of Armenia. He's not really networked in the Armenian yeah. community, yeah. but he respects his heritage. So he says in the email, oh, you know, so many people, blah, blah, blah. But... As long as he promises to tell the truth without putting a spin on it. And yeah. that's all he had to say. I'm like, that was it. All I want to do Good. is tell the truth. So it was December. I find out where he lives and I'm about a half an hour from the home. And again, as a Christian, I'm like, I can't believe I'm on this journey. I can't believe I'm on this ride. And I'm about to meet the live, the, the one person still alive who knew Sogomon Tellurian better than anyone else on the planet, right? If you want to know this story, well, Sogomon's dead. What's the next best thing? The person that knew him the best is still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Well, his so, wife passed away, yeah. right? His widow passed away. His son, he had two sons and one of them passed away, but this son that's still alive actually lived with him like at the end and at the beginning and, and, and was the closest of the two sons to him. So I'm half an hour away from the doorstep. And I, I just offered up a prayer to God. I said, I said, God, what do I want? I don't know. What do I want from this meeting? And the, and the answer hit me like a ton of bricks. And I literally started crying. I started crying. It wasn't, let him sign over the rights to be bought. It wasn't any of that. It was, I want to be considered as a family member, like a son to this man and his wife. Yeah a grandson to Sogomon Tellurian, right? That's like, where does that come from? Out of, out of left field. It's like, I want to be welcomed into their home. I want them to I embrace me completely. <laughs> it's like, and I started bawling when that pop, that thought popped in my, I literally started bawling. So I get to the front door and I knock on the door and open the door. And the first words out of his mouth, have you eaten? <laughs> of course. That's, the way baby that's the way armenian hospitality you break together man you break bread together 
So he brings me into his, his den and uh, his wife's there and we meet and he brings out a plate of meat, cheese, uh, uh, crackers and deviled eggs. And I'm, I was on a deviled eggs kick at the time. My youngest daughter was learning how to cook them. So I'm, I'm like, these deviled eggs are amazing. They're amazing. So then when the conversation starts in earnest, the first words out of his mouth were, I'm not a religious guy, but I know something's going on. <laughs> like, that's the first thing I he mean, says to me. And we have a long conversation. It's a, a good hour, hour and a half conversation. And then, you know, boiling down to, I want to tell your father's story. He's like, oh, it's been told so many times. I'm like, if I've never heard it, it's never been told. If it hasn't been told in English, it's never been told. Yeah. I want to tell your father's story. And I'm not kidding. These are the words out of his mouth. Well, you liked my deviled eggs. So, okay. <laughs> That's and all it, it took. Right. And so the chapter, right? The chapter in, in the story is the deviled made him do it. Oof. <laughs> right, the chapter. I got to back up real quick. I talked to an intellectual property attorney before I went on this trip. Okay. And I said, how do you get the life story rights from somebody? And this is his expert legal advice. They just have to like you. I'm like, oh, okay, it's out of my hands. It's yeah, out of my hands. They're that's all like it takes, that. yeah. guys. That's all it takes. Wow. The devil made him do it. That's, I'm, that's the uh, beginning yeah, that's of the problem. joke, yeah. But yeah. Uh, summarizing, I soon thereafter had a meeting, got a, an initial investor to lock down the IP, uh -huh. uh, which is, yeah, well, it included research into all mm -hmm. the countries in the archives, but also getting the translation done and building, uh, setting up the intellectual property company. And literally... It was this long process. As of January, one year ago, this month, Project Justice LLC owns the life story rights of Sogolman Talerian yeah. in perpetuity. It's not yes. an option. It's not yes. something that's going to go away. The family doesn't want anybody else to tell it. They're sold on my version of telling that yeah. story. So Now, a really quick follow-up question. If like that process that you've gone through after this initial meeting, um, was there... Was there any complications that you ran into? Was there any, um, what's what, what, was there anything? Let's say the immediate family or whoever was left, kind of maybe may have. I, and I'm not trying to tap into anything personal. You don't have to reveal any of that. But was there some sort of complications? Anything that may have kind of may have seemed like there was a few bumps in the road. There's a number of bumps in the road. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll pick one or two. Um, yeah, you don't have to reveal anything sensitive. So like, was there a complex process to it? Like, uh, very I, complex. I think that's where you're trying to get at. Uh, like, more yeah. or less. Yeah. So, well, I mean, sorry to cut you off. Okay. I mean, they agreed to this, yeah. but then, right. but then that's after a verbal, this, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. a verbal thing. But then after this, there had to be some sort of back and forth yeah. for a yeah. while. This wasn't yeah. just like, Hey, here, take it and go. Yeah, of course. There's no way. Uh, even with that, like they were literally like that. And I said, you know, we'll do this and you'll, you know, you'll get a percentage of blah, blah, sure. blah. Like we don't want money. What do I need money for? It's like, mm -hmm. they weren't, they weren't negotiating. They weren't arguing that they no. were like happy. They wanted me to succeed, but for them just willingly to do that, there's a whole nother world. It's oh, called the law. Course. It's called Absolutely. the law. <laughs> and so this is a, it was very, very, very complex, uh, unexplored, unresearched field of intellectual property. Mm -hmm. And so I won't go into all the details, sure. but a couple of the wrote, not even real hiccups, but like, for example, Sogolman Talerian had two sons, yeah. which is two separate yes. branches. Yes. One in the United States. I mm -hmm. can't disclose any more than that. The other in Europe. And Z Zavin. Are they both alive or uh, at the time it was, it was Zavin is alive. And then the widow of the other brother was alive. Okay. So it goes from, from the son to the widow. That's how the rights were. We know mm -hmm. the name of the other son. The other son's name is Shahin. Shahin. He was the older son. Okay. Um, and his widow was still alive at that so, time, at yeah. that time. And she has since passed away, but I went to Europe and I got an interview with her and her granddaughter. And so her granddaughter, Sogolman Talerian's Sorry, Sogolman's granddaughter. Uh, the yeah, Sogolman Talerian's granddaughter is the one I, I dealt with. So I had to, we um, the family have have an attorney, and he's actually a family friend, but he's you know an intellectual property attorney. And then my partner has some legal is 
legal schooling. He's more of a business guy, but he has. So they they put together a, a, a life story rights agreement and everybody signed it and everybody was happy. Okay. And then fasting, fast forward, I get a high level Hollywood attorney on board and I show her the life story rights. She's like, hmm, some things missing in this. Uh, you got to, we have to do an addendum to really lock this down, yeah. right? If you're not a Hollywood attorney and you do a life story rights agreement, you just, you know, throw something together. And so she, she did it and nailed it. And one quick story, and this is a, another miracle. Okay. Since I've already started it, we're going to tell I mean, I, tell, I, I know there's, I know there's a lot more to this. All I right. Mean, so it has to be a year ago, just before the agreement was signed, the lawyer was going back and forth with their lawyer about the addendum and it was getting, you know, finalized like questions and answers and everything added and subtracted from the agreement. Our lawyer, my partner and I get on a conference call with our lawyer. You know, this, we didn't have a lot of conference calls and my, my partner, we don't see each other. We're not buddies. He's a businessman, right? Yeah. So she's like, you guys need to get together today to sign this because They've agreed to these terms. You need to be in the same room, sign it with the same pen, and then we'll send it to them. And it's locked down, right? This is out of the blue. In the morning, she said today. Like, wow. He's about to fly out of the country. Like the next day, he said, literally, yeah. I'm flying out of the country on business and my schedule is full. He calls me about an hour later. He says, well, what do you know? My schedule says, I'm going to be in your town tonight. I mean, it's like every single piece of the puzzle seems to be falling in place. Well, let me tell you, this is the most important thing. I've given my life for this project, yeah. and this is about owning the life story rights. Like, this is no small thing. No. Our lawyer says you have to be today to sign it to lock down the ownership of life story rights, and he's already got it on his schedule. He goes, I'm going to be there at 7 o'clock because my son has a basketball game. Holy cow. I'm like, really? What time? 7. I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> My son has a basketball game at seven. Wait, this gets wait, better. Wait a second. Is your son on, where does your son go to school? It's this private school. Yeah. It turns out I had no idea his son went to that school. My son played his son against each other. Against each other. So the school calendar already had us meeting together before we knew we needed oh, to meet together. God. The school sports calendar Already had us in the same room the day our lawyer told us for the first time we needed to be in the same room. I'm telling you, and it gets better. My son and his son are both the best players on their respective teams. So they're the captains of their teams and they play head to head. My son and his son. Like wow. we, we were, we oh, went, my. we met, we signed the contract. This is a movie itself. <laughs> right, right. So we already signed the contract. Well, he sits in his section. Well, we have section. this recorded. Yes. yes. Part of the yeah. documentary. That oh, by the way, by you. the way, all rights belong to. No. <laughs> it's a, you guys are already on the inside. You guys are just by having me on. Right. So, and the kind of the icing on the cake was we won. Right. But our sons were, had the same Jersey number. All right, all right, all right. Hold on. Are you serious, man? I, I wouldn't make it up. I, I'm not kidding. I'm sorry, but it's, it's it more up. of like one of those rhetorical questions. Like, I yeah. can't believe this is really happening. Wow, all the stars lined up. Holy cow, man! And so, I recognize that as a miracle. Like, I'm looking at this. Sure. Going, okay, Lord, you got me. You got me. It's His confirmation. Like, if I tell that. Certain people I tell that story to, they're like, they have no idea. It's like a coincidence you're reading into it. I'm like, okay, you can think that, but this is the most important thing in my life. And there's no explanation for how that happened. Yeah. 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 No, no. I, I, I oh, we believe in that. All the signs pointed that this needs to happen. Um, again, I want to thank everybody who's joining us live on YouTube, uh, Facebook, and X. Guys, we do see your questions. Yeah. <laughs> So I know, um, I know it's from different platforms and yeah. not no no it's all it? it's YouTube yeah it doesn't matter but we do see your questions we'll ask Michael we just don't want to interrupt the story right yeah. now I know Bonnie had some questions so uh, go ahead if you want to ask the question now we'll we'll you know circle back to it uh, when when the time is right and uh, we'll we'll have some questions for Michael but um, I know when we were talking and and even uh, in this book. And we'll talk about the book in a bit. Um, there is 
a very important mandate that Zavin kind of put on you, which was to tell the truth. Um, and, and I know that's an immense responsibility on your shoulders. Uh, what, how, how are you going to ensure to, to tell this story the right way uh, with historical facts and, and with, with the words of Solomon? to make sure that it is portrayed the right way? Very important question. Telling the truth. So I met a historian right away, yeah. right? And one of, the, one of the odd things that I learned from historians is they don't use the word true. Right? It's not in their, it's not in their semantic domain, right? Yeah, like no, true, uh, we'll, we'll talk about historical likelihood Based and probability. Upon a true story. Well, it's, it's, it's a his, history avoids the word truth. Yes. Hollywood is all about truth. Right. It's like whether the Hollywood believes in truth or not, they want to tell stories that feel true. Yes. And yeah. so uh, here I am so convincing. So uh, it's very important to mention here. And now uh, is Sogamon is not a character to be like his actions are not to be emulated. Yeah. Right. It's uh. very important to point that out because the, uh, op the, the opposition to this story will be like, Oh, you're, you're encouraging vigilante justice, right? You're encouraging a s terrorism essentially. And that's not what this no. was. Absolutely not. And the proof is in the pudding. He was acquitted and his trial is referred to as the birth of international law. Right. Yeah. This is like the proof is in the pudding. This was a good thing that happened, but you can't replicate it. Right. There is no, there is no, uh, you, you, there's only one Hitler and there's only one hero of Hitler, right? Hit, that's the story. Yeah. This is the story of Hitler's hero and the kid who killed him, the kid who killed yeah. Hitler's hero. Yeah. It's not, oh, there's this bad Turk and I'm going to go because of Sogomon, mm -hmm. I'm going to go do what Sogomon did. There is no replication. You, there is only one Hitler's hero. There's only one Hitler and only one Hitler's hero. Yeah. This is a one off thing instance in history. Yeah. This is a special event. So very important to mention the truth of this story, the word assassin saint, which is the title of the book is that juxtaposition Assassin, we think that's evil. Evil. Saint, yeah, there's a bad connotation to it. Yeah. Right? So the book of Judges, was Gideon good or evil? Right? He was called to kill people. Of course. Right? Deborah. Yep. Right? They're, they're called by God to kill people. And that's the, the controversy, but that's the fact, right? Solomon Tellurian did a good thing by killing someone. Whoa. It's it's irrefutable. And so uh what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> truth. Tell the truth. Right? Tell the so, truth. Yeah. Tell the truth. The yeah. core yeah. of the truth. And and this is a thing, like uh the dis dispute is I believe Sogman did a good moral thing, right? Because Talat was negotiating to return to power to continue the genocide. Which, and the genocide did which continue. would have had repercussions. Yes. A lot further, bigger repercussions. Absolutely. Right. So it was immoral for the Treaty of Lusane, right? There's a there's a treaty out there that was yeah, not the right one. Yeah, Luz, Luz, I don't know how it's pronounced. I know, it's the, the France, yeah, yeah. France. Right, there was a treaty that did the wrong thing, right? Yes. Wilson so was signed Versailles. Oh, Versailles and no, there was Lazuan too. Yeah, or, okay. At least that's the way I said. Versailles and so there. Essentially, what should have happened was Armenia should have had its territory. Yes, Assyria should have had. Mm -hmm. There should be a nation called Assyria yes. today. Yeah, Greece should have actually had more territory, yes. right? Instead of Turkey having all this land, right? So there was an injustice that happened. Uh, so it's very important that I make that distinction. Mm -hmm. And I also say, I personally use the phrase "saint" as literally as possible. So did something saintly by killing a man because it was absolute justice. He was an evil human being. And and the comparison really I make, was. so Gregory the Illuminator, who I'd never heard of before yeah. this, right? Gregory the Illuminator, the kind of the origin story of, of the first Christian nation, Gregory the Illuminator, he was the Illuminator saint. He was called to communicate something. He's the Illuminator saint. God mm -hmm. called him to communicate a truth and the proof is in the pudding. So Montalarian was called to a specific task. It wasn't the illumination. It was assassination. So assassin saint. I put Sogomon Montalarian on the level of Gregory the Illuminator. Yeah. All right. So telling the truth, I had to go to the historians, right? Had to go to the historians. And one of the things historians will tell you is that a memoir 
in general, a memoir is not as reliable as certain other information because a memoir is a personal, personal account. Personal feelings, personal And people always, em- people always either embellish or neglect, yes. right? Yeah. They kind of self-aggrandize in memoirs. And so when you go in knowing that, you're like, okay, you can still get factual information out of a memoir, keeping that in mind. The problem or what differentiates Sogomon Tellerian's memoir he couldn't possibly aggrandize himself higher than he already was. He killed Darth Vader. Yeah, more or less. How could you brag more than that? What possible boast is there higher than killing, blowing up the Death Star and killing Darth Vader? So his memoir is simply an account of what he went through. So first of all, I believe Sogman wrote the truth in his memoir. And, and, but then memoir is not enough to tell the whole story. So that's why I went on, I went to 15 archives in eight different countries on three different continents with historians and a camera crew, by the way. So this is all documented and uh, had to fill out, flesh out the story. Sogman has his own journey that he went on, but yeah. there's all these other players, all these other major characters. There's Grigoris Balaki and the, the, uh, the author of, of, uh, uh, Armenian Golgotha. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Which is an which is a yeah. heavy book. I mean, try reading that. He's a major character in yeah. this. There's Armin Garo. He's the Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? The, yeah. the yeah. bank Ottoman yeah. story. Yes. Right? That's Armin incredible. Garo, yes. That's a that's an episode all by itself. Absolutely. It's like the origin story of of Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so g- with the historians, not just an Armenian historian. I went into the Turkish National Archive with a Turkish historian. Whoa. Right? Whoa. How did that go? Whoa. I'm telling you, when we were getting off the plane, or when right before we got on the plane, so I went with uh, my uh, with Armin, yeah, and my Turkish historian Mustafa, and and, and really quick, and this Mustafa character was completely fine with, or and he knew what you were looking for. Yes, and I hope he's watching. He oh got, my the god, I have so many questions. <laughs> but before we got on the plane, he's like, um, "If I'm detained in Istanbul, you guys go on ahead." Wow. I'm what an honorable guy. So a week prior to our trip, he, one of his colleagues had been detained at the Istanbul airport because, and I, I asked him, I said, so in academia, I don't just mean the Armenian historians. I mean, in academia in general, globally, yeah. uh, what's the consensus? Is it, yeah, some Armenians killed some Turks, some Turks killed Armenians, yeah, some Nazis killed some Jews, some Jews killed some Nazis, right? I'm like, yeah. what's, what does academia say? He's like, oh, it's, it's the absolute fringe kooks that think that this was just an ethnic dispute. He's yeah. like, it is established that this was young Turks, the leadership yeah. massacring Armenians. This mm-hmm. is a Turk saying this. And it was very important for me to have both sides. I'm telling you, this story has been fact-checked by a Turkish historian and an Armenian historian. So anybody who attacks this story, they have to deal with all of academia. Yeah. So telling the truth. Wow, man. Wow. That, that's amazing. Now, the, the book, now this is uh, this book that you put together. This is the first episode. This is a script or, or at least a foundation of the script of the first episode in there. Um, and, and I want to mention by reading it, everything you're telling us right now, which is the fact checking from the first opening scene, which is beautifully written to have the flashbacks and then go tell the origin story of Talat as a young Turk and all his buddies. And then mentioning all the heroes like Armin Garo and so forth. Everybody's in there. I mean, I, I, I was amazed because as you, because you it, you know it's a lot of people might not know how to read a script but when you're reading it and every scene is changing you know exit scene enter scene day this and and you're reading it i was just already imagining it and if this is shot the right way with high production my god the world is going to be i mean uh, i i don't know what to say it it would be emmy after emmy and and it's just it's Again, I know this needs to be refined, uh, and I know once more uh, studio heads get involved, you know, there's always opinions, this, that, but, and I hope, and I hope, um, and you see this happen a lot in Hollywood, that it's not modified. 
the way yeah. you're telling it because you are you are telling it the right way. But but naturally, as he was touching on earlier, and I'm sure you can agree with me on this, is the whole story already has everything. Let's quote unquote air quotes what Hollywood would require. Yeah, to tell a story without too much deviation from the truth. Yeah, but because, I'm talking about the because scenes. it has it has all the well the sh the cinematography no not just that. It's it's the conversation between <clears throat> these these characters and and maybe somebody oh well maybe sure, we should I change mean, it like this to that, make that's it more you're getting you know, into like yeah. Writing, that's what I'm saying. Dialogue the, and one sticking to it. The story in and of itself. The story in and of itself like he touched on the overall soapbox is the the revenge yeah. aspect against yeah. the empire yeah and and right? like the star wars feel that's why he touched on that earlier was like that's that's the selling point yeah you know and, what I and, mean? and the idea for this is to be at least a it's four a season uh call it a mini series or whatever but uh, i mean I, I i think season one is just going to be the whole uh pretty much the lead up to the genocide pretty much right if i'm not mistaken well, from what I got from reading it. Yeah, but, there has to be context. Yeah. Um, and, and, and this book that you put together, which thank you for giving me this copy. It's, it's beautiful. And I'm fighting um, for it. I want to mention this. <laughs> oh, I gave it to Matt Harris. <laughs> you have you are, your your parents you gave it to mary it was fun, but uh right now it's with after me you're done Rass, you're done so i'm gonna put this um qr code actually let me change that that's not how we want it okay so ladies and gentlemen this qr code this book this copy uh if you guys scan that it will take you to projectjustice.info and if you guys scroll down there will be a donate button and when you donate, um, there's different levels. If you donate $25, you will get a PDF copy of this sent to you. If you donate $50 or more, you will also, you will get the hard copy, printed hard copy, which is beautiful. And I'll tell you why. Uh, I don't know if the camera is going to show this, but the way the script is written. Um, so you have the script on one side. On the other side, you are seeing a map of showing where this is taking place and all the characters in that scene. And it's all the historical characters. Yeah. So, um, and this is going to help put the funds together to, yeah, it's, it's a bit white out, yeah. but it's okay. Um, so this is, this book, once you guys help uh, by donating, all those funds are going to help for production costs. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot, that needs to happen for this to take place. We want this to be a high production series uh, and it costs a lot of money. Uh, it's in the millions. Just an episode is in yeah. the millions. Well, that's what it takes. We don't want this to be shot to with, you yeah. know, like a home video or, or you know, <laughs> low budget or yeah. anything of that sort. This needs to be told the right way. It needs to be shot the right way. Cinematography is everything. So you can do your part by donating and helping Michael out with this project. Um, and we'll talk about more where we are and all that. So let, let, and again, I want to thank everybody um, who's joining us live. I, I, they have some questions. I don't yeah. know. Do you want to ask some questions right now? Or we yeah, can we go? can. Yeah, we can. Is there Before anything? we take a break. Yeah. yeah. We can. Scroll up. I, I don't know if I can. Let's All right. Go. If you guys want, start rolling in the questions. We'll yeah. go ahead and start asking some questions. Oh, I did see a question. Some, I think one or two people asked. I, I know this is kind of maybe fast forwarding, but uh, you did mention that or may have told some of your followers that you took a trip to Armenia. Do you want to talk about that before we get back into the nitty gritty? Sure. Okay. Oh, good. I'm glad you've asked yeah. that question yeah. because I've mentioned this off camera again. This was life changing for me. Right. Yeah. My life has changed dramatically. I and mean, my, my family will tell you, everybody that knows me will be like, oh my gosh, she's okay. like, he's obsessive, like yeah. it's obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm like, no, there's nothing no. more worth obsessing over than justice and a buried treasure story that could break open. Like this is something that could unify. Oh, it could change a lot of things. Here's the thing. One of the things I came across and I'll talk about Armenia here in a yeah, second. Yeah. One of the things when I first came to this story is like, oh, is it possible to have an entire ethnic population unified around a story? 
Absolutely. Right. I can't think of any other story. This is a national hero. And like you were saying, 90, 99.999% of Armenians like regard Sogman oh, yeah. as a national, as a national, hero. national hero. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have an entire ethnic population behind me what? on this. And that was like humbling. I'm like, I'm not even Armenian. But not only will it Arme- unite Armenians, but just like Schindler's List is not a Jewish story. It's yeah. a human story. Yes. This is exactly like that. It's something that can unite and unite us across political differences, yep. a pause, even a theistic differences. Like this is something we can all unite behind. Yeah. Genocide is an ultimate evil. And here's a story that was suppressed, oh, actively suppressed. Actually chose. So going to Armenia, when I landed in Yerevan, I'm not kidding, within an within the first day, within the first couple hours. This is the thought that crossed my mind. If I can ever have a second home, it's going to be here. Okay, but look, b- before you continue, can I ask? And I and I, I, we didn't have enough time off camera to discuss this. But the thought for your initial portion of the trip was what? What was what was the reason? Was it to do the research because you got an invite, or was it because I can't write a script until I walk? Okay. In his shoes. Okay. Right. I had to go to Berlin. I had to walk the the path where he yeah. he followed Talat. Like he saw Talat. He pr- like we can go into that. Yeah. Uh, I had to see where Talat's house was. Right. Literally, I couldn't write a scene with Talat until I knew it was right across from Hagia Sophia. Like literally, mm-hmm. it's on the corner, right across the street. I'm like, I had no idea until I got there. Yeah. I had to go to the culture, the land. I had to go into Etchmiadzin, where Sogomon Talarian sat with a hundred. Orphaned babies laying on the floor in Etchmiadzin that didn't have parents. Some of them weren't moving because they were already dead, right? Uh, I had to be there. I had to go into Korverop where Armenia was born, right? Yeah. Korverop. I went down into the pit. I had to be down there where, where Gregory the Illuminator was. And I, and this again, yeah, yeah. was not planned. My historian planned everything. Yeah. And we showed up at Korverop on a Sunday. And there was a full-on worship the, service yeah, going on ass. in the yeah. monastery. Yeah. And I had a red camera. I had a camera guy with me with a red camera. Whoa. And so I'm like, you were prepped with and it was all this. Yeah. In there. I'm like, get in here. You gotta film this. And I have my my phone cam, my 4K handheld phone camera. And I'm like, I pan up and I look at this footage later. I pan up while this choir uh, in Armenian singing, doing a liturgy that's been done for centuries, centuries, like the oldest worship service, Christian worship service on the planet. Yeah. I was connected to it historically by walking in that room. It was this out of body experience. I remember panning up and I have this footage panning up and the sun is coming through the, through like the one of the skylights and a yeah. bird flies up in and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I can't believe this. So being there is part of, of knowing you know, who Sogomon was. I had to. I couldn't even start the script until I had been there. We went into the archive. We found his prison diary. We, we're talking to the archivist. And she found out what we were working on. I said, oh, I have something for you. She goes in. I get the camera guy. Oh we, we filmed it. She pulls out Sogomon's prison diary. <laughs> like like his handwritten well, diary. Can I, can I ask really quick about that? Let's say, and, and this is completely layman's question, is something like that, let's say, you walk in and you encounter the fact that you may have access to a prison diary. Do you have to go through any legalities to obtain that? Those are all because questions in the back of my head. International. Let's say, because it's international, do you have to go through any legal hoops or anything like that to obtain? <laughs> we asked. We went there not knowing it was there. Okay. And I didn't know. And, and that's why I'm asking, because, I mean, you're dealing with, like, going international. Well, right? like, who owns it? Yeah. Well, again, right. is that like who is that owns. is that considered public uh, domain? Public domain. domain. Yeah. Well, it was written in a, a Berlin jail cell. Yeah. And it landed in the Yerevan National right. Archive, and this lady knew it was there. Okay. And nobody else. Okay. So that's to it. Know. So I mean, it's, it's, there wasn't anything yeah. that you had to go through to obtain. Or that, be able to yeah. use this material. That in itself is yeah. arguably public domain. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because okay. it was tw- 1920. Well, I've always wondered about things like that. That's why I had to ask the question because yeah. it's just like, it's something you just kind of fell upon or you encountered. Yeah. And I, Michael, I honestly, I love your passion and I feel <laughs> yeah. your passion. Yeah, it's awesome. amazing. It is so breath, like it's refreshing to, to see someone um, that is not Armenian to, to understand what we feel. Uh, the pain to go and actually do the research and walk through the shoes of this man to know. And I'll tell you one thing as Armenians, 
we it, it it's this pain has pa- been passed down through our DNA, ah, uh, more or less, and it will always be there. Every Armenian when the child that learns about our history and and knows what we went through as Armenians, it, it's a feeling that unless you walk through our shoes and really know the truth of what happened, you won't understand. And um, Bonnie had a question. This is for us, actually. She's like, for, for the hosts in your location, are the Armenian young people, 2025, 20, in touch with their historic events and understand the significance of it? Bonnie, um, one of the main reasons we started this podcast yeah. uh, and Med Hedosned, it translates to our heroes. Yeah. Hedos means hero. Med means our. So it's our heroes. And the point of this was Mike and I are history buffs and both of us didn't really know our own history that not, much. Not to that extent. Yeah. You just know so certain tra- landmarks. The, the point so- of this was for us to kind of relearn more in depth our history. And as we're doing this, to share it with the world, with Armenians, non-Armenians. In English. In English. And the reason we chose to do it in English is because... We're almost three years into this podcast. Yeah. We're listened to in 74 countries mm-hmm. around the world. And we have people listening to us from all walks of life with different yeah. backgrounds. And we get so much love from people. You obviously get the negatives from we know who those yeah. are. Yeah. But Trolls. you know what? We yeah. welcome them. Absolutely. We welcome them because we are going to continue telling our story over and over and over. Because the biggest problem right now is... And this is both from Turkey and Azerbaijan. They have fabricated this story so much with their fake history. Lobbying power. Not just that, just it's basic. True. An average person does not know history. So what happens is if you yourself, let's say, never heard of Azerbaijan and you meet it, somebody from Azerbaijan and that person has been brainwashed from their, you know, from their Fuhrer um, <laughs> that this is... <laughs> This is what the real history of Azerbaijan is, which is all fake. And this person comes to you and starts telling you, oh, Azerbaijan, ancient Azerbaijan, ancient lands, this, that, all that stuff. You yourself, who probably won't even take the time to do research to find out, you're going to be like, oh, okay, well, they're they're ancient people. And this lie keeps multiplying, multiplying. And as uh, us. We as Armenians have to constantly battle right now. Our 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 battle is in so many different it's in fronts. Information warfare. So, having people like Michael, who believe in the truth and want to tell the truth, there it's not just Solomon's story. There are hundreds and hundreds of stories of those Geronimos that you're talking about in our culture, even before the genocide, within our history, that's our other goal. We tell these stories about our great kings and queens and these warriors that did amazing things. We've, we've had a messed up history, guys. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not like, it's not like glory and victories for yeah. 2,000 plus years or three. It's just, well, we're even disappointed in some of yeah. the let actions. Me, let me interject. Stogelman Talerian would love this pod- podcast. Okay. He was a an educated young man, uh, right? The, the Azerbaijanis and Turk will call him a crazed terrorist. And the sure, Armenians whatever. will call him the, you know, this, this lion, the lion is a lion. Yeah, the David to the Goliath. Yeah. He was a normal kid who loved his own history. When you read this, he references some of these heroes that you're talking about. He knew his history. He knew the importance uh-huh. of it and telling the story. It can't be told in a movie. That's why it has to be four seasons because there will be flashbacks because I want everything he told to be told, yeah. but he will reference some of yeah. these heroes that you're talking about. It's a very complex story. I mean, especially during a very um, intricate time in history, right? Yeah. You're talking about World War One, and then all the events leading up to World War One yeah. are all tied into this that lead up to these events. It's, I mean, even with world history, forget about, let's let's put aside Armenian history, not forget about, but let's put aside Armenian history. There's so many different events that led up to the culmination of World War One, yeah. and the fallout to World War One, which changed the world map. If yeah. anybody knows, yeah, it absolutely altered the world map. Of course, in so many ways. And those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Oh, absolutely. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. absolutely. Don't we start learning history? It's yeah. Such a pivotal point in history. I mean, and this is, I'd say, a microcosm in that 
point of time, but there's so many events that led up to that moment in time. Let me talk about this book real quick. Yeah. Um, what this is, uh, quick overview. This is not episode one. This is the arc of season one, right? In fact, episode one and episode two aren't even covered in this. Yeah. This could be a standalone episode. It's that compelling. But I had to cut a lot of stuff out just to get the main story sure. arc, right? So what this is, it's it's this is the arc of season one, but it's also an academic curriculum because it's been fact checked by yes. historians. And if you look at it, and 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 those of you who are going to get a copy of it, in the very beginning, it says how to read this lookbook. It's a Hollywood pitch deck or lookbook where you, yeah. this you you show to a producer yeah. or an investor and they get it. They look at it and like, oh, here's the costumes and here's the storyline and here's the, the locations the all yeah. in here. But because it's been fact checked, you are actually learning accurate history. So it's it's merging these two disciplines, entertainment and history, yep. and is a very specific way to tell the story. Hollywood has this terrible it's a, it's a trope that goes around. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Yeah. Right. Don't oh, let the yeah. So Hollywood's not oh, yeah. interested in the facts. The problem is Hollywood is the only one that can tell history properly to engage the culture. How, how are you going to get young people interested in history? You got to put it on a screen for them. And if Hollywood is just making up stuff, people are going to start believing nonsense or nothing at all. Oh yeah. So this Absolutely. is a moral imperative to get this done yeah. this way. Yeah. I want to mention something I'm seeing in the chats. People are saying that the link is not working. I think it's, it's an iPhone thing. If you have an iPhone, it's probably not going to open up. So use a desktop. Yeah. Desktop. Um, you know, uh, it, but the website is project justice dot info. There's so three, type, there's three, um, addresses you can type in to get to that same location. Okay. Projectjustice.info, yeah. sogomontalerian.com, or assassinsate.com. We'll and uh, Ara uh, Kulian is sending you love from Yerevan. Yeah. So that's uh, uh Hamp Hamp's uh, brother. Yeah, Hamp's yeah. brother. Yeah. 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 Okay. Small world. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Your mind knows him. Wow. Good awesome. Awesome. Ara awesome. It is a good friend. Okay. The link is fixed apparently. So if you guys scan it, uh, it should work now if you yeah. have an iPhone. Um, so let me also interject this, that contribution button, it, there's no upper limit. <laughs> you, everybody will get a PDF for 25 minimum. Everybody will get a hard copy for a $50 minimum, but to get production up faster, the more you contribute, the better. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, like anything else. And we're hopeful, uh, some, you know, um, wealthy Armenians in our community who are passionate about this story, who are passionate about our culture. will see Pass this podcast. Uh, pass it along. Uh, if you guys need to get a hold of Michael, you can always reach out to us and we'll connect you guys. Um, it, it's very important that we tell this story. Um, and it, it, there's so many stories that need to be told, but it has to be told the right way. Storytelling is everything. Um, so, but again, I want to thank everybody who is uh, live with us. Uh, thank you for all the comments. Again, if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to ask and uh I see that. No, uh, Eric, it's not on Amazon. This is not on Amazon. Yeah, so it will be, it, it will it, be eventually, yeah, eventually. Shortly. Yeah. yeah. In a month, probably. Yeah. So, um, all right. You want to continue or? Oh, you. Okay. Mike has to go. Unfortunately, yeah, I so, have another um, engagement. Yeah. I'm going to. So, guys, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a quick commercial break and then we'll be back and uh, we'll, um, well, it'll just be Michael and I. And, I'll see you next <laughs> next time. <Damn. laughs> New what a night, man. <laughs>
All right, everybody, we are back. Thank you for uh, that little break we had to take. Um, unfortunately, Mike had to leave. He had already a prior engagement, and uh, sometimes these things happen. But we're going to continue with the conversation. So what I wanted to do is talk about um, uh, the research process, um, you know, f- for the series. How did you... Like, can you, actually, can you go into the details, like gathering the information? Like, Lib, I know you kind of covered it, but more in depth, like the process of it. Yes. Um, so there were multiple things going on simultaneously. The research trips had to happen to for a number of reasons to to fact check certain things. And then when inevitably, when you go into research, you discover things you didn't even know. Of course. And so that was all essential. And then simultaneously, my translator, because we were talking earlier about the, the richness of the Armenian language, yeah. like yeah. Stolman Talerian knew, like he was extremely well educated for a guy who never got a college degree. Right. So wow. he was actually tapped in when he was 17 years old before leaving the Ottoman empire, because at that time, all of the Armenians, when you turn 18, you're either conscripted into the military or you get out of the country before you turn 18. Yeah. yeah. And so, you talk about that in the book. Yeah. And his yeah. teachers, his, his teachers at his school that were, they were, they had a shortage, right? They had a shortage of teachers. So he was tapped to teach an, a lower grade while he was a, essentially a junior or a senior in high school. Yeah. So he, so he was educated. He, he knew his history. He was sensitive. He loved poetry. He memorized poetry, right? If you're yeah. a poet, it means you, you have a certain depth to you, uh, you know, grasp and understanding. So he was, um, uh, there's a scene that you talk and it's beautifully written where he's teaching uh, these young kids as a, as a substitute teacher, right? And how the kids love the way he's telling these poetry and and then the meaning behind the poetry. And from there, the kids actually uh, kind of yearn for him to, for him to continue. They don't want the actual teacher back. They want him to continue, which is, which is so beautiful. And it, it says a lot about him. It's important to convey his character. Yeah. Like, when I got into this, obviously he's, he's such a hero and you heroize somebody. So many attempts to tell this story, turn him into James Bond, right? They turn yeah. him into this, yeah. this swarthy, you know, sex object, you know, and that wasn't him. He was a normal yeah. guy yeah. who just loved all he wanted. Like his only ambition was to have a family and grow and live in the in the land of his ancestors, right? That's all he wanted. He wanted to yeah. have a, a career as an engineer and grow crops and et cetera. And, yeah. and so, so what stood out to me was how normal he was and the fact that he married the girl of his dreams at the end. And, and there's more to it. Like, here's, the, here's a big kind of a tangent, but one of the things that sealed the deal for me to, to the actual heroic nature of Sogum Tellurian he could have lived in the United States because when he succeeded, uh, the ARF brought him back to the United States and they took him on a tour and people were kissing his finger, the finger that pulled the trigger. And he was this larger than life hero. Yeah. And they set him up with a store. Like they're like, you'll be set for life. You'll have your own store and an income and all the Armenians will patronize you and you'll do fine. You'll, you'll live in freedom like you always wanted to beforehand, which is now impossible in your homeland, but here's the next best thing, America. You, you'll prosper and you'll live for, for, for you know, you'll, you'll never have a concern. Yeah. Except the girl he fell in love with prior to all of this couldn't get to America. Really? She, she had a sister that couldn't get a passport and she wouldn't leave her sister behind. Like this, this is like the After character. what everybody experienced, I mean- it's natural, right? They want to get out, but she, her, her sister couldn't get. And so were they in, in Germany as well? Uh, no, they were in uh, Serbia. Serbia. Okay. And uh, that's where his father, during, Sogomon's father left the Ottoman Empire when Sogomon was a child. He barely yeah. knew his father. Yeah. He like, you know, like people go out of the country. I think he to went to money. serve in the army or was it work? It was work. Left. It was just work. He no, left his with his brother, went, right? With his uh, his two older sons and his brother. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they worked in Serbia, sent money back home. Occasionally, would make a visit. Yeah. Uh, except when in about uh, 1905, 
this is a tangent, but in one of the gift packages he sent home, uh-huh. there was a picture. He had taken a picture with some friends and one of the friends that he was had taken a picture with was wearing like a Serbian military garb or something like that. Like he was, he was an official. And so the Turks, the Ottomans would go through all the mail and, and open everything up before they deliver it. Yeah. And they saw this picture of Sogomon's father with this guy in military uniform. And they jumped to the conclusion that Sogomon's father was a spy because he was associated oh, with some. Wow. And Sogomon's father, when he tried to come back on the next trip, it's about 1905 was arrested and thrown in jail for six months because they thought he was a spy. So this is Sogomon's father. He never really knew him and his father couldn't come back ever after that. Wow. And so, so Sogomon Tolerian is when he, he got everything he wanted after he succeeded. They set him up with a shop in Cleveland, Ohio and Zavin, his son, he, he says, my biography, the, na- the name of my story, I should have been born in Cleveland. Like, that's what he <laughs> wants to do. I should have been born in Cleveland, but because the girl Anahid that Sogman fell in love with prior to the war couldn't come. Sogman gave up freedom in the United States of America to go back to Europe to go into Serbia and live ultimately behind the Iron Curtain, right? Ultimately, well, it was prior to the Iron Curtain, but he, yeah. he went and lived under Tito, like communist regime. To, he gave up America for love. That's Sogomon Tolerian, right? He just wanted a family. He didn't care about being a hero or anything. He changed his last name. He yeah. lived a normal life. Yeah, That showed me the character of this guy. Like, okay, this is a relatable hero, a, a, and every man who was called to do something special accomplished it and then lived a normal life. Yeah. Also a true hero, a true hero. Yeah. And in the, in the writing process or in the research process, especially. So what I did as my, my, his, my historian is feeding me information. I'm like, tell me about this. I would just like, I would just text. I, I need yeah. more information, more details. And so he would get the answers. And then my translator, Ishkan Jinbashian, the num- there's a miracle behind meeting him and getting him on board to translate this. He's the number one guy who could have done this. And he was honored when I said, we want you to do the family's authorized English translation of the Sogamon Tolerian story. It was like an honor for him, but it was like a 16 month process such a rich, deep language of course, yeah. to I mean, do it I right, imagine, like, right. To do it justice. Yeah. And this is the guy to do it. And so I'm trying to write the script and I don't have all of the story. I know, I know the full arc and I know the important points. So I'm saying, Hey, stop what you're doing. Give me this section. And he would send me this section give me this section and send me this section. But any screenwriter knows page one is the most important page. One of the script is the most important. That's how you capture the reader you have to yeah if, if the reader at the bottom of page one doesn't go you've failed right yeah. if he doesn't flip what is next yeah and so i literally started page one 15 times and it's not an exaggeration i had 15 different false starts how do you start this incredible story how do you start this incredible story and then this idea occurred to me i'm like ishkan set aside the memoir for now give me uh, pick up the the prison diary Give me page one. Because I realized what page one was. Sogomon Tolerian for six years had this burden upon him to assassinate Talat. Like he had a vision. Think of yeah. think of Joseph uh, having a dream of of the, you know, his father and mother and, and the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him when he was a kid. Right. And then he goes through all this hardship. And then later in life, that dream comes to pass. Like this is Sogomon's story. He had a vision of killing Talat. How is this kid going to get to Talat? Yeah. Eventually it comes to pass. So after he actually accomplishes this, this burden that's been on him for six years, he gets thrown into a foreign jail, Berlin, where he doesn't speak German. He's by himself, doesn't have anybody that speaks his language. And he sits essentially in solitary confinement. It wasn't solitary confinement, but he has nobody to communicate with for 10 days or actually it's three weeks, three full weeks and then he describes later in the diary, he describes the day that uh, his daily coffee has slid in the door with 10 blank sheets of paper and a pencil three weeks into his, his incarceration. And he, those, th- those blank sheets of paper, he describes rushing and snatching them up and writing, just starting to write. This is page one of his prison diary. He's writing after meditating 
upon his success after meditating for three full weeks without anybody to talk to on what he had just accomplished. I'm like, I'm going to see what the first thing he writes is. Yeah. And then he, he says, my coffee got cold. He completely about it, forgot about his coffee. <laughs> yeah. Page one of his prison diary is page one of the script. And, and, and you put it in there beautifully. I got to say, like I was, when you gave me the book and, um, I, you know, and I started reading page one, I, I couldn't wait to, to turn the page. Yeah. I just, I, again, I, I'm not just saying this, everyone, if once you guys get a chance, you will understand what Ma Michael is saying, what I'm saying, it really captivates you and you want to know more. And then from there you go to the origin story of, of him and Talat and everybody in there. And, and it, I think you've done a great job. Like I said, I thought this was episode one, but if it, it's it's an arc, even better, you know? So well, page one is, the so page one would be the first scene of the first episode. Yeah. But then you jump to essentially episode three. Yeah. And I, I could go into detail as to why that is, but. um, One question I have is, uh, I know it's still early, but are there, any major people in play that are going to be behind the camera or in front of the camera? Where are you with that stage? Have you planned it out? Uh, is there anything you can share? I can do a little name dropping. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, first of all, I, I can, I, let me cast some hope out there. Like I mean, you know, to bring this series to life, I mean, I know it's going to, and again, I know you want to do this the right way. So we want the right people involved in it. And the right people, and it has to be done the right way. And what yeah. Mike was getting at earlier, like studios have their way of doing this. And let me stay yeah. right up front. Hollywood could ne would never tell this story. Hollywood, the machine, yeah, would never tell the story, mainly because of who the villain is. Yeah, right. The villain is a it's a he's an Islamist, right? He's an etihadist. He's a Nietzschean etihadist, right? Well, not just that. You also have the political machine or the, the Turkish lobby, which will never right. allow, I mean, just the, for the promise to be made all the couldn't do it through Hollywood. Yeah. Right. It was very that, difficult. Yeah. So, so, um, but so first I'll talk about, um, some of the, the style of how it must be done, how it will be done. I want ethnically accurate characters, right? I want every, Armenian to be played by an Armenian, right? I want the top Armenian actors to play. I have, I have a, I have a role for Michael Gorgian, right? Like, yeah. did you see Americazzi? Oh my God. Amazing. So I've actually spoken to two of the producers I actually did meet Michael as well. And so I got a perfect role for him. Like when the time comes, I, yeah. um, uh, what's her name? Um, uh, Shoot. Angela? Yeah. Angela Sarafi. I, I have yeah. the role for her, right? It's like, I, I, there are amazingly talented Armenians. I want them all to be ethnically accurately casted. And, and one of the ways Hollywood says, well, you have to have an A-list big star in order to get something made. No, the story is the star here, right? Yeah. The story will make stars. Uh, I think Sogum and Talarian will be an unknown actor who will become famous, Right, because yeah. it's got to be a 20, 25 year old Armenian kid who's incredible, and there's nobody like that. Like, there's no A lister like. Yeah, this story is the star. So I want ethnically accurate casting. I also want to shoot, um, essentially shoot every scene twice: once in the native languages and once in English. Right. Wow. So while you're shooting, I want every person to be able to speak their native tongue, and then cut. Now let's do the English version. Right. Instead of overdubbing and all that stuff, do two versions. It's all set up. It's all the all the emotions are there. Learn the lines in the both languages. So those are some in, innovative, different ways, um, and that will be more expensive, a little more expensive, but it's worth it, right? Yeah. Now, as far as who's behind the scenes, who's interested in this, that I know would come on board as soon as the financing is there, uh, Ralph Winter, um, and I'm only I'm only going to name names that if if this got to them and they heard that I had mentioned their name, they're like, oh yeah. So yeah, Ralph Winter yeah. was actually instrumental at the beginning of this. I actually met him through a friend. A friend of mine goes, I know Ralph. You want to meet Ralph? I'm like, yeah. And Ralph told me all about the promise. He confirmed a bunch of my you know bunch of the thoughts I had about the promise. And and Ralph says, hey, 
whenever you have meetings with investors, um, I'll make it, I'll put it in my schedule. And when I got my first investor, Ralph was there and that, so Ralph is on board. Um, then I have a very, a personal friend, a guy named Jeff Kirschenbaum. He's a, uh, essentially he's Vin Diesel's producer. He, okay. He did, he worked for Universal for years and uh, then he left Universal at the top of his game. And then Vin said, Hey, I want you to keep making my movies. So he's made the, he's essentially Fast and Furious from Fast and Furious 3 through 10. And so that guy's a personal friend of mine and he says, I want to help you make your movie. And that, that doesn't mean he's got the money. It means yeah. when the money comes, he's willing to help. So I've of got A listers. And then, yeah. and I'm going to drop this name and I don't know if he's watching or not, but I just met Howard Kazanjian. Um, uh, in July. Okay. And he read that cover to cover before I had that version of it. It was an early version. It was all the same, but I hadn't yeah. actually printed them up. I got it to him. I said, Howard here, read this. And he responded. He said, what's the next step for this well-researched project? Right. That's what you want to hear from yeah. a guy, right? He, Amazing. he wanted and essentially wanted to read more. I said, this is the spine of season one. He's like, I want to read more. So that's, I mean, at this point he would be a consultant. Like again, yeah, depends yeah. on the financing, but you've got, I've got a listers that are all on board and interested. That's a, that's going to kind of segue into my next question for you was going to be, you know, you, 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 you talked about how you want this to be four seasons, right? Um, can, do you have a vision of the structure of each season um, of how you're going to tell this story? And can you talk about that a bit? Yes. And I'm glad we had time to, when I, you prepped me with some of these questions and I'm glad we got to this question. Cause this is a big deal for me. And like four seasons, how can you, you gotta, it's going to be boring if you try and stretch it out. I'm telling you this story, as I've researched it, there's, there's nothing, nothing boring about this. And it's important to point out, Another one of the another one of the miracles. Let me just say, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, pitch a a screenwriting book for anybody out there who's interested in screenwriting. Did I bring it? Yeah. All right. So prior to me coming to this story, prior to me ever uh, understanding, you know, learning about the Armenian genocide, I um, have a friend. Uh, Brian Gadawa, he's a Christian screenwriter. Um, he's he's been a close friend of mine, and we workshop ideas together. And he says, "Hey, if you're going to write scripts, you got to read this book. It's a book called The Moral Premise." Mm -hmm. Here, let me put this on the screen. Anybody who's interested in screenwriting, read this book. So uh, I read that book, and I've read a couple of screenwriting books. And you know, I'm an editor by profession, so I have the technical skill, but. Uh, writing is a, is a whole nother skill set. What this book, essentially this book, he's, this is a guy who like, for example, Will Smith uses this guy, like Will Smith will have an idea and he'll say, Hey, write the script or fix this script or whatever. So this is a, a, a known Hollywood come on quantity. This guy wrote this book, basically doing a, a research project. He says, I'm going to, I'm going to study all the most successful films in in Hollywood, all the blockbusters and see if there's actually a pattern, if there's a formula, a structure to storytelling. Yeah. And lo and behold, there was a structure and he put it in a screenwriting book. So I decided, okay, I'm going to write a script based on this process. I wrote the script and I got it into, I mentioned the guy, the, the guy's named Dave McFadzian, who's a close friend of mine, who's the creator of Home Improvement, again, name dropping, but this is yeah. just the world that God has brought me into. Yeah. I wrote a script, got it into his hands, and he's like, you can do this. Okay. Proof. You know, I, I applied this principle, uh, a known Hollywood quantity says this is a good script. I'm like, okay. So I, I, I understand story structure. Fast forward a couple of years, I come across the Solomon Tellerian story and Armin Manokaloyan translating it for me on the fly. And I'm listening to it and I'm like, I need to structure this, but it's already in the same, in the right structure. Like that pattern that Hollywood writers force a story into in order to make a successful story Sogamon Tellerian lived a narrative. 
he, this is just his personal account of what he did. And all of those structure, the structure is there, right? The, the hero, the, the, the save the cat moment, the inciting incident, the end of act one, the uh, act two, a, when he does the wrong thing or the right, right thing for the wrong reason, the wrong thing, like all of these moments that have to happen in a story that have to be spaced a certain way. They're already in there. They're already in there. When I wrote it out, I just, I'm just going to write this. It broke out into four equal sections. Act one, act two, a act two B act three. So when I realized, well, it's longer than a movie, yeah, but it's structured the right way. Then I realized, Oh, these are the spine of a story arc because I was cutting things out. There's other major characters that you have to follow. Not, I just wrote Sogamon's story, yeah. but you got to write Arangaro's story. You got to write Goris Blocking's story. You got to write, uh, what's her name? Um, the origins, the origins of these main characters are so important. Yes. Because they, they play a big role. His mother's story, right? Yeah. Like these incredible stories. So season one ends with the end of the genocide. Season one ends, you get through the whole genocide. You get, uh, Kind of the midpoint is the defense of Vaughn, right? This yeah. heroic charge, and then they abandon, and the Russians abandon. There's all these, inc- these different episodes, and, and the end of season one is the volunteers, the Armenian revolutionary, or the Armenian volunteers are abandoned by the Russians because the Russians had their own problems at home. Yeah. And Sogomon is appointed to be the gatherer of orphans. Like literally he's rebuilding a genocided nation, he himself. And then he has the vision of killing Talat. So the, the kind of the cliffhanger at the end of season one, they've abandoned us. Will there be justice? He literally passes out on the floor of Etzmiadzin after hearing orphans testify about watching their, their loved ones being massacred. And he has this visual uh, post-traumatic stress is what we would call it, but he has this kind of -of out-of-body experience and he passes out and he has a vision of actually killing Talat. So this is like the burden, the mantle be put on at the end of season one, the end of season two, he's tracking down Talat. He gets to Istanbul. He finds out about the informant who was, who was uh, instrumental in turning in the Armenian intelligentsia to the Turks. Yeah. And he, he assassinates the informant, right? So he, he does, that's like doing the wrong thing for the right reason, yeah. right? So that's the cliffhanger at the end of season two. Season three, he gets connected with Operation Nemesis. He goes to America. He comes back. He gets put into Berlin as a spy, and he successfully tracks down Talat and assassinates him. That's the end of season three. Yeah. Right? Cliffhanger at the end yeah. of season three. Season four is, is he's in prison. He goes on trial, and he's acquitted. And the, the finale, the, the final scene, or the second to last scene, is not guilty and the courtroom exploding in excitement, because that's literally what happened. Everybody yeah. in that courtroom thought he was going to go to his death unjustly this guy this guy talat deserved to die this guy did it but but he killed a man and our law says you have to go you have to go to the death sentence for killing man like that and the jury it's called jury nullification i've talked to lawyers it's jury nullification this is unprecedented this kid's not guilty and the courtroom explodes right that's the finale except there's a denouement there's two denouement. You know, denouement is like that last little scene. At oh, the end, right? okay. After the, after yeah. it's all resolved and everything, yeah. then you have this kind of little scene. There's two denouement. One of them is Sogamon marries the girl of his dreams, right? And like he yeah. marries her and there's the wedding yeah. ceremony, but the very last scene, and this ties it to the spinoff, which is the next series. And this is, this is just, I can't believe that this is unknown and this kind of seals the deal. And this is the spoiler. You're all going to hear it. There was a guy in the courtroom who was called to, def- uh, to testify for the defense. There's was a guy named Max von Schäubner Richter. And he was a German military attache um, in the Ottoman empire because they were allies with Germany during world war one. Germany had a military commander in each vilayet yeah. in, in the Ottoman empire. Max von Schäubner Richter was assigned to Erzurum, Erzurum province, Erzurum, yeah. it, where Sogomon is from, also where Armengaro was from. Max von Schäubner Richter, from a Christian nation, Germany, allied with a Muslim nation, the Ottoman Empire, watching, helping them massacre Christians. Right, so Max von Schäubner Richter has this cognitive dissonance. He's like, wait a minute, the Armenians aren't rebelling; they aren't murdering Muslims. These are all lies, and he's telling his German commanders, like, no, no, it's not true. What's happening? So Max is a, he's he's allied with the enemy who's doing evil. So so he's called to testify in Berlin about what was really going on. 
they didn't need his testimony. He was on the list because they had a long list of witnesses and they only needed like 15 of them for the jury to really get it. But he's in the courtroom. He didn't, he didn't live in Berlin. He was in town for two reasons. One, in case he needed to testify. Yeah. The other reason, he and his best friend were there to meet with an investor because they were launching a magazine to promote their new political party. So the very last scene is Max celebrating at the end of the trial, walking out of the courtroom and going to his hotel and sitting down in the cafe with his potential investor. He's like, hold on, my friend's coming down from the hotel room. I'll, I'll introduce you to him and then we'll talk business about investing in our magazine. His friend comes down from the hotel room. He's like, oh, so-and-so, I'd like you to meet my best friend, Adolf Hitler. Oh my God. Adolf Hitler's best friend was in the courtroom to testify in the defense. So what happened was when Max went home from the trial or to the hotel, he would tell Hitler, this is what that guy Talat did. This is what that guy Talat did to the Armenians. And so that's where Hitler got his ideas in June 2nd and 3rd, 1921 is where Hitler, the seeds went in. He learned what Talat did. A few years later, he would do it himself. That's, yeah. that's the end of this season four. And that's the launch of the spinoff series. Wow. I can't wait. <laughs> uh, let's so, make this happen. A lot of history here. Yeah, that's amazing. Important. And 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 wow, I I I'm, I am so amazed and and proud of you. The research you've done, um, you know, it, the way you're telling this story, it's it, there's so much passion behind it, but it's factual, and I love that. I love the fact that you've done all this research. You've put so much effort and time and your own personal money into this, and. Um, Oh my God, I can't wait. This, this has to happen. This has to happen. And, it's happening. And, and uh, I, I, my God, and, and everybody who's watching and will be listening, um, you know, please go support. I'm going to put that QR code again. Um, if you guys um, want to see this come to life, um, you know, like I said, you guys will, will get the PDF or the book, whatever you can. Um, I understand right now times are tough for, for most people. And, um, but if you can, you know, donate and help Michael in this production, we, we would appreciate it. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, you know, a series of this magnitude is going to have so many challenges. I can't even imagine from number one, from the political side of things, um, I, I, I mean, you're going to have the wolves after you, you know, um, how are you, and, and uh, again, I'm not sure where you, you, if this would be shot in, in on stage or if it would be actually on location, uh, what are, have you planned out the, the challenges that you're going to face and how you're going to, you know, oversee this? What I want to do and. So, you know, we're at the beginning. Yeah. This is the beginning. I've been on it for a little over six years. Anybody in Hollywood will tell you that most big projects, just the development side takes 10 years on yeah. average, right? Yeah. So I'm six, six and a half years in. I'm like, oh, I'm on track, right? So there's no, no frustration, no discouragement. There's been nothing that has ever happened in this process to, to turn it away. Like it's never been put into turnaround right? That the, the turn, the turn around and, and forget about it. No, everything has moved forward. This actually, this podcast, like inviting me on is literally the beginning of the uh, publicity slash uh, book tour, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's an honor. And I hope, you know, we maintain this relationship because I have a, a calendar of things that are coming up, all building toward April. So I just spoke to a guy on the phone. Uh, part of the process, being a producer, right? It, you got a lot of hat. You wear a lot of hats. You got a lot of irons in the fire. But the main thing is networking with people. So I was on the phone with a guy uh, a couple of days ago, uh, based in New York, who's very excited, you know, about 
this project because when, when you're in the East Coast, I'm like, well, I'm coming to D.C. in, in April to speak, and I'm planning on setting up an a in-person meeting for anybody who's interested, whether they're just people that want to learn about it or people who want to be, invest or people that want to collaborate and be a part of it. And it's like, let's do one in New York as well. I'm like, it's April. It's obviously the perfect month. We'll do one in L.A. We'll do one in Fresno. We'll do one in New York. We'll do one in D.C. That's all coming up in a couple months, literally all ramping up. And so the people that understand this project understand I am going to be a target. And that's why the investment needs to come. The money needs to come because I'm going to be a target. I need to be protected, but I know the Armenians will want to protect me. Yeah. And I'm not worried. You know, it's like, <laughs> I, uh, what is it? Anything worth doing is worth sacrificing for. Right. And, and what else is there to live for? Yeah. Right. No, what? So. I agree. I agree. And and it's funny. Uh, Lucas asked the question: Is there any entity that would not want this story out there? Yes, Lucas. The entire Turkish government, uh, the Azerbaijani government. Um, unfortunately, the the Turkish uh, public call it a society who has been brainwashed that there was no genocide. Um, because the thing is, till this day, um, you know, the Turkish government says that the Ottoman Empire was, you know, they have no association with it. That's the former and this and the Young Turks, so forth. But they themselves have still not recognized and they will not admit to what they did, uh, even though it's their ancestors, you know. And, and this is what baffles me is Germany. We all know the horrors of what happened. Now, Germany owned up to what they did. Till this day, they teach their youth of what they as Germans did and how wrong was it to make sure that it never happens again. But yet Turkey, nope. What did they teach? With their Turkish empire and the, the you know, with their brothers in the other, uh, the other side is the hatred of Armenians and to continue the Armenian genocide. They want to see Armenians disappear from the face of the earth. I mean, as a human being, you sit there and you think about it. It's like, why, why, why do you want this? One of the oldest people on the face of this planet to disappear. What is it behind us? What is the truth? Why do you want us to disappear? And, when you learn about Turks and, and, you know, again, there, there are good Turks out there. Unfortunately, most of them don't know their own real history. And, um, because of that, you know, I, I can't blame them because, you know, if, if you're, if you're kept in this bubble and you've been told this false story over and over and over and over, when someone like you or me comes along and tell me, hey, what you've been told is wrong, automatically they're going to be in defense mode. What are you telling me? You're telling me everything I know about my ethnic background, everything about my history is wrong? So I have asked myself this, this one question over and over again, why me? Right? It's like, this is a monumental moment in history. It's literally the etymology of the word genocide, right? The etymology of the word, if you don't know where people think genocide, oh, it's one of these words that's been around forever. No. Which is thrown right and left right now so loosely, like as if it's... Right. Everybody uh, knows that word. Everybody yeah. thinks they know what it means, yeah. but it, it came into existence in 1944 and is tied directly to the actions of Solomon Tolarian. So... This is a moment in history that has been completely obfuscated by the you know decades and multi millions of dollars of uh, orchestrated campaigns by Turkey, Germany, and the United States of America to suppress. I mean, and the British, and and the British, right? So there's complicity at the highest levels. But now we live in an era where, and this is where I I credit Kirkorian because even though the wrong story was told. Right, the promise was the wrong story. It was so perplexing to me when I, after watching him, like only because I'd started researching, I understood the context. But I'm like, wait, these three main characters aren't real people. Like, 
that was like so yeah it's it but what Kerkorian demonstrated was you can do it without the machine the hollywood machine it can get done turkey can't shut it down the united states can't shut it down all right so yeah. now we live in a time when it can finally be told and we just crossed a threshold 2023 was the centennial of the republic of turkey 100 years right the Republic of Turkey was established in 1923. So we just crossed the centennial. They believe the genocide, they were successful, that it's like genocide is a long-term process, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. It's once a genocide is only successful when people forget that a, a culture ever existed. So they had a hundred years thinking they were successful. Well, they're 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 asleep now. They the promise failed. They think the Armenians can't tell their story. Yeah, well, the Armenians do have an implicit problem. People, if an Armenian's trying to tell the story, everybody thinks it's just an ethnic dispute. If an independent voice comes and is able to clarify and differentiate, like the first meta one of the first metaphors that occurred to me when I came to this is Armenia is a gorgeous, amazing forest, but the Armenians can't see the forest for the trees because every Armenian has an amazing story. That's, yeah. that's another characteristic. Every Armenian I, I meet is related to somebody who has an incredible story of survival because only the ones who survived were able to procreate. So every Armenian yeah. in existence alive today is related to somebody with an incredible story. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous forest. But, but they're all trying to tell their own story or this person's story, my story, yeah. this story, that story. I'm like, yes, your story should be told. But the world only sees a forest and there's one tree that's taller that Armenians don't necessarily see it. They recognize Ar Sogomon Talirian is the great hero. But when I step back and I see Sogomon is the tallest tree in the forest, once the world looks and sees that tree, then their focus could come down and go, Oh, this is what happened. Yeah. Right? From the outside and I'm an objective third party. What do I have, you know, what 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 do I have? What's what's at stake for me? Like justice. I, and this is an important point I need to make here. Sogomon Talirian is the only Armenian to ever experience justice. He's the only Armenian to have watched the life disappear from the life from the eyes of the villain. Like Sogomon Talirian himself looked a lot in the eye right before he pulled the trigger. I mean, he literally, he, he describes it. He describes a, a serenity coming over him in that moment. And he describes under his breath saying, hey, Talat, and Talat looking and recognizing. And it was important for Sogolman for two reasons. Number one, he needed to confirm that he wasn't killing an innocent man. Sogolman went out to just kill somebody. He would yeah. need to make sure he was killing the right guy. And then, Talat needed to know why he was about to die. And Sogomon Talirian is the only one to get that satisfaction. He personally experienced justice, but there are two sides to justice. There's, there's judgment for the perpetrator, but what about recompense for the victims? And the only recompense will come when this story is told globally for everyone to understand. And so this is about this is a moral imperative to get this story told properly for justice to finally be served and for denialism to actually disappear, right? Armenians have lived for a couple generations thinking denialism is never going to go away. This is the only way to do it. Tell it in a compelling narrative. And it's true. One of the characteristics of this story is the closer I get to the details, the more compelling it is. I'm not fabricating stuff. I'm, I'm creating dialogue and scenarios, but they're all within the spirit of the truth. All of the important points of this are actually factually accurate and dramatic and compelling. Very well put, my friend. <laughs> I mean, it's an honor. Um, I, you know, me being being part of like that creative world and everything you are telling. I, I am just seeing it in front of my eyes. The the vision, the way you're describing it, it is amazing. Um, my last question to you is. You know, you kind of touched on this, but what is the, you know, the project is made and I am sure it's going to be successful and hopefully it's on some major platform like Netflix or, or something that, that the world can see. Um, what impact and what do you expect the takeaway to be for today's audience? This is 
my goal isn't just to tell a story, right? My goal isn't just to make the next blockbuster or the next yeah. thing. That's not the goal. The goal is to transform culture, right? We, like, like we said earlier, those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. And we all hear that. We hear it and it resonates as true. And we think, oh yeah, that's true. But what it's supposed to in incentivize us to do something. It's supposed to incentivize us to learn history. I'm like, oh, learn history. That's so boring, right? History is not elevated as something we should be pursuing. You know, you know, go watch a football game or whatever. Like, there's other things. But when you, if you can tell this true, compelling narrative on the level of Game of Thrones meets Schindler's List, yeah, you're going to be not just entertaining the world. You're going to be educating the world. So there's this parallel path that's happening. I'm not just trying to get the funding to make a, a, a series. I'm going to be converting this into a curriculum. It's already, this book itself is the student version of a curriculum. I'm developing the teacher's edition because every page of this is a lesson. Like this yeah. is ac it's an accurate history. So getting it into the curriculum from grade school up to postgraduate, this will be the module that every school needs to have prior to the Hitler module, right? Teach this so that everybody will understand where Hitler came from. Because from right now you've got two rows of books at the bookstore on World War II, and you've got maybe one shelf of World War I. Yeah. You transform culture by getting it into this generation that's coming up so that everyone that comes up in the next generation will already know this story. Denialism will vanish and there will be no such thing as denialism. That'll be a, a, a dramatic cultural shift. So it's not just making entertainment. It's merging academia with entertainment, call it edutainment, so that when people go and watch this, they'll actually be getting a doctorate level education in history and being entertained by it. You can binge watch this twice, take a test and get college credit, like literally because it's signed off on by historians. It's not fabricated. Wow, I never looked at it like that. That's amazing. That's that's, that's the parallel track that you know, I'm, I got one foot in academia, yeah. Georgetown. I got a, a Yale professor, et cetera, and Harvard. And I got one foot in Hollywood. And, and it, this story merges them, and it creates a new storytelling paradigm. History, historic narratives are popular in Hollywood. Well, this focuses that even, this concentrates that, right? So that it's an entire new genre where you just tell accurate history you find the compelling stories. You find a hero like Sogomon Tellurian to be like that Forrest Gump character that takes you through all the momentous yeah. events in history. And it's true. So, Well, I, like I said, I am, I wish you the best. I, I, I hope um, the right people, and I, and I know the right people will come in, uh, in, in your path on this journey that you are on. And uh, uh, anything we can do on our end to help you with this, uh, you have our full support and uh, hopefully, like I said before, the right people will watch this episode um, and, and connect, hopefully connect us, uh, connect with us or, you know, connect with you directly, whatever we can do to make sure that this project comes to life. Um, uh, we're at the two hour mark. Uh, I want to thank everybody who is joining us live on YouTube, Facebook, and X. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's in the East Coast sticking around. I appreciate <laughs> it. I know it's late. Um, before we sign off, um, any last thoughts, any message you want to put out there to our audience? Um, this is just the beginning. It It's an honor to... <laughs> be the representative of the Sogolman Tellurian estate. I mean, that's, that, that's factual, yeah. right? Like, um, Harut Sassounian, you know, kind of a renowned, he's an edit, you know, he's a, an Armenian uh, journalist. He said, Sogolman Tellurian is the national hero. He's our national hero. And I'm like, I'm an outsider. And I represent the national hero. I'm literally the representative of the Sogolman Tellurian estate. Well, Sogolman, his sons married non-Armenians. And so his legacy spreads to other ethnicities, right? Sogolman is a human hero. And so to, to honor the Armenian hero and to be that transition, that bridge from Armenians to Christians, 
right? There's Christians, there are a lot more Christians than just Armenians. And this is a Christian story. The first Christian nation, this is my history. I am connected to this history. And it's up to me, I'm like the apostle of the Armenians to the rest of Christendom. That That's what's going to explode this thing. I think God yeah. is in this. So yeah. Yeah. Pray for Amen. me. Pray for Amen. us. I, I, I believe in this. Um, and I am um, thankful that I got to meet you. Uh, and um, you are you are a friend to the show. You are a friend to us from this day on for life. For life, and uh, and like I said, I I can't uh, wait for this to to come to 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 become real reality, and and for people to see how beautiful you're going to tell this story. Um, having said that, again, I want to thank everybody who joined us on this episode. Um, I typically end a show with my partner here, but like we said, he had to go. Um, if you guys like what we're doing, please consider becoming a Patreon and supporting us. You can go to patreon.com slash and support us, uh, with a small amount starting at $5. It helps with, uh, expenses of producing the show. Uh, follow us on Instagram at medhedosned where, you know, we put all our updates of upcoming shows. We'll have another episode coming up, um, in a couple of weeks. We will be off next week, uh, as I have other engagements. So, um, we have other guests who will be joining us soon. Uh, there's a lot in the works. Um, this season has been a little bit on and off due to a lot of cancellations with, with guests that we have, you know, some people are getting sick plus the time some people are in the East Coast, it's it's so difficult to schedule oh, yeah. um, uh, people to be on a live show. And, you know, sometimes we can pre-record it, but it's not the same. So yeah. we, we love doing it live with our guests. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, I want to mention the the sculpture for for uh, um, Hike for Our Heroes. That one, it, like I said, it's it's been delayed, but it... We are in the process of the mold being made and um, we don't want to announce it until production has begun. So we will uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have that ready for you guys to start doing the pre-orders. Uh, and, oh, and the book, we want to plug the book again. That QR code is on the screen, everybody. So you can scan it uh, or just go to project justice.info uh donate um if you donate $25 you'll get the pdf version $50 or more you will get the hard copy and anything else is all going to go towards this project to help fund it yeah make sure you put in your accurate email address that's the only way we're yeah. going to be able to get yeah. to you and there is on that same website a, a place where you can fill in your information so you know if you have messages for us uh, that are outside of donating you can communicate with us that's a direct line to me so yeah yeah again uh if you haven't subscribed to our youtube channel please uh subscribe hit that notification button and um so and when we go live you'll be notified or when we upload new episodes um you'll get to watch us uh the one-on-one -on -one that me and mike do um and also uh on facebook if you're watching us on facebook make sure you hit that like button and make sure you hit the like button on this video because it helps with the algorithm for more people to see it uh besides that again i want to thank everybody who joined us tonight i want to thank you michael appreciate you being here it's a pleasure and uh usually i we have this back and forth. We always say respect one another, love one another. Until the next episode, take care of yourselves.